Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we're speaking with Senna Jimjimo, who is Executive Director of the Oromo Legacy Leadership and Advocacy Association. The website is O-L-L-A-A. Org. Senna is an Oromo American born and raised in Ethiopia. She was a key player in the adoption of U.S. House Resolution 128, an important factor in enabling change in Ethiopia in 2018. Senna Jimjimo, welcome to Talk World Radio. Thank you so much. I'm pleased and happy to be here and to be talking about the Oromo people. Uh, for those who don't have a clue, who are the Oromo people? Uh, where do they live? What is the background and history? You know, David, I've been in the U.S. for 20 plus years, and um, I've always run into people like, oh, you have an accent. Where are you from? And I've always hesitated to say Ethiopia, so I always say I'm Oromo, and they'd be like, what is that? <laughs> so yes. it's, very, it's very common, something that I'm very much used to it and something that I I am, you know, willing and happy to tell you. So I think um, if I can, you know, it takes a little bit of time, but I'll try to be as short as possible. Yes, please. All right. So the Rum people are one of the ethnic group uh, residing in the Horn of Africa, particularly in Ethiopia. I don't know, 90 percent of the population of the Oromos live within the current state of uh, Ethiopia. And Ethiopia have about roughly 50, maybe about 90 ethnic groups. So Oromos are one out of the 90, but they make over 60% of the, the, the country's population. Right now, Ethiopia is 123 million. So you do the math, 60% of 123 millions of them are Oromos, uh, but they are just one of the ethnic groups within the country. But the interesting thing about the Oromos, David, is like just like you know a lot of our audience here on this show, that nobody have heard of them or know them in their language. Afan Romo is not even in the, you know, uh, as a country's uh, official language yet. And in fact, you know, we're going to talk a little bit later. It was illegal that could put you in jail if you are caught promoting Afan Romo or speaking Afan Romo to more than two people just about 30 years earlier. So Oromos are the, you know, one of the ethnic groups in Ethiopia in the Horn of Africa, but they are also in Kenya as well as Somalia and other parts of the Horn. So you have a country discriminating against the majority of its population. You, you know, Dave, it's so funny. I'll give you one example. I, two years ago, I was talking to a member of parliament in Europe. I'm not going to mention the country. So the meeting was set up to bring up about the human rights abuse of the Oromos. The first question the MP asked me is like, how is Oromo protecting the minority within Oromia? So I was, I was just like froze for a minute, but like, I'm here to talk about the oppression and the subjugation and the human rights abuse of the Oromo people under or within the state of Ethiopia. But here, you know, uh, people are always asking about particularly ethnic group that have dominated since the country or the state was created 150 years ago. So it is very unique case, uh, David, where the majority have always been at the mercy of minority. And it's, it, it's, it might be surprising, but uh, it's, it's not so unique. It's not known, but I think in a lot of African countries, one of the main, the leading issue, the conflict is this, where the majority are suppressed and the power is at the hands of minority. And the minority have to work with the outsiders to check, to keep in check the majority under the, you know, uh, uh, control. And that's exactly what's happening in Romania. I mean, in, in Ethiopia, you know, where I don't know how many countries, David, that the majority language is not even an official language of the country. I know it's not unique, but I don't know how many. Uh, it's certainly a problem. Uh, so, so what is the recent uh, history, Senna, of of violence and politics in Ethiopia, and what what was it that uh, that the U.S. Congress did uh, five years ago? Yeah, five years ago, four years, five years ago, it was historic, uh, David. I think uh, maybe um, a lot of people might not remember a lot of things about Africa or Ethiopia in particular, but one thing they probably do remember is. Uh, the Ethiopian prime minister became the first uh, 
the Nobel Peace uh, Prize recipient in the continent, if I'm not mistaken, uh, for the peace agreement that he did with Eritrea. It was such a honeymoon moment. He was kind of seen as a, the Messiah, you know, the savior of not just Ethiopia. I mean, he was, you know, uh, modeled. If you look at the uh, lots of international uh, newsletters, I remember Times News have uh, his picture and the main cover, like a whole first page was his picture. Many, many uh, media was covering him as, you know, such a young, in 43 years old, uh, person who is promoting democracy, preaching exactly what the people, what the world was so hungry for Africa, you know, for change where the young people can be empowered. He was a young man, obviously, in just early 40s, uh, four, five, four and a half years ago in 2018. But before that, what people might not know much, David, is it took four years from 2014 up until 2018, there was non-violent, peaceful, struggle that took the life of over 5,000 Oromos for that change to come in 2018. The, tw the chain that brought him to the, the current prime minister to the office and the chain that brought him to the international stage as a Nobel Peace uh, Prize recipient. So 5,000 Oromos paid the price. But another important factor, David, the prime minister was part of the previous government for 27 years that have murdered endless people and pushed out millions of people outside of the country. And that, that, that government is seen as a repressive government. That's why they were pushed out of their power. He was in part and principle of that government. Yet, you can, you know, I think audience have to ask, how can somebody who is being part of the military, part of many different uh, official uh, capacity, here he is brought in as a savior because, you know, 2018, 2017 and 2018 was a very, very hot moment because millions of Oromos for the first time was protesting. Uh, and then international community, particularly the U.S., for the first time saw the Oromos and saw the people that changed must come. And the government at the time, it was a coalition of four major kind of uh, ethnic group, majority ethnic group, but one is kind of coalition of other ethnic groups, the Oromos, the Amharas, the Tigris. But the Tigray, particularly the Tigray Liberation Front, was the dominating force for 27 years from 1991 up until 2018. They were the key players and then they were pushed out through a peaceful and the prime minister who grew up, he joined the military at the age of 14 in the system, in the very system that he say have oppressed and killed. And he asked for forgiveness, uh, uh, David, I'm, I'm literally skipping so much, you know, uh, timeline what happened. But uh, so five years ago, what happened was 5,000 or more young men. And later on, in 20, at the end of 2017, uh, other ethnic groups also did join uh, to protest against the oppression. But it was the Oromos who paid the heavy dearly price. Sadly, the Oromos are again paying the price, uh, David. We're, we're speaking with Sena Jimjimo, who is executive director of the Oromo Legacy and Leadership and Advocacy Association. Uh, Sena, the, when the United States last uh, had a president get the Nobel Peace Prize, it seemed to do a great deal of good. He he didn't bomb more than seven or eight countries at a time after that. Uh, how how is it working out with the with the current government uh, in Ethiopia? You know, before you answer that question, it's like I'm just wondering. You know, so this Nobel Peace Prize gift uh, versus you know the amount of life they seem to take with them. You know, Nobel Peace Prize, but yet uh, you see the recipients. Uh, you know, whether it's from the U.S., a very democratic country, versus Ethiopia, a very repressive and democratic country. You know, this uh, recipient, how they behave before they receive a Nobel Peace Prize and after, it makes you wonder, like, for those are for the young people in college to kind of look at, like, let's do the assessment of those recipients. And in memoir, if you look at it, what happened, you know, she received a Nobel Peace Prize. And, and, and uh, um, so I'll leave it that one. So a uh, question was, like, how is it going right now? Am I correct? Yes. And, and what's needed? What, what do we need to do right now? 
what's needed, David, is the, I think, uh, November 2022, about two months ago, going on three months now, there was a peace agreement that was signed by the federal government and the Tigrayan Liberation Front or the Tigrayan uh, region government. And I think it's important to kind of even back up and see, really try to understand. So Ethiopia as a state is, the right now there's about 12 regions within Ethiopia. Oromia is the largest region, the most populous region, and also 57% of the crop come from Romia. 59% of the Nile water that everybody knows about comes from Romia. Coffee, gold, you name it, a lot of natural resource is actually within Romia. Uh, so Romia is a though it's one just region among the 12, but it is very important uh, area, including the capital is at the hearts of Oromia. So it's, you can imagine how important Maka of the Africa, the Saba of Infine, as we call it, reside is at the heart of Oromia. It is the capital city of Oromia as well. So the conflict has always been ongoing, except the first six months when the prime minister came to the office, April, 2018. Up until November, there was relatively peace in honeymoon time, where there was no really uh, at least direct engagement with uh, with the armed group. Uh, the armed group have just returned to the country uh, per peace agreement that was uh, agreed in Eritrea, you know, to bring back uh, opposition from outside. It was just, you know, a surreal moment. But until by the end of 2018, December, a state of emergency was declared in Romania in part of Romia and southern part, as well as in a western part of Romia. There have been a bombing since 2018, as you can imagine. But up until 2020, November 3rd, nobody knew what's going on, except there's this young Nobel Peace Prize recipient that is getting flood of support, both financially. I mean, you can imagine as anything, everybody was so happy to take a picture with him from Bill Gay to, I don't know, any leaders that have not went to Ethiopia or not taken a picture with the, with the current prime minister. But I think 2020, November, after the conflict in the Northern, it was kind of a surprising moment for the international community. They'd be like, wait, what happened? Um, so for a moment, they uh, stopped and asked, and that was kind of a moment. But I think it is important. Six months be before that, in July 29, 2020, very prominent or almost singer, songwriter, and human rights activist was assassinated. Leading to that, and after that, hundreds of people were killed. The government admitted to about uh, 400 people, if I'm not mistaken, and they arrested about 9,000 people. But the opposition put that number at at least a couple of thousand people were killed and 100,000 people were arrested. Uh, internet was shut down. I mean, billions of dollars were damaged, property was burned, lots of life was destroyed, church, mosque. It was a very intense, high moment. But that is six months before the conflict in the Northern. After the conflict in the Northern happened, everybody kind of became aware slowly, slowly. It became obvious by summer of 2021, there is a civil war going on in Ethiopia. The international community began to speak about it. Finally, after two plus years, in November 2022, the Tibetan government, the federal government, and the regional government, Tigray is one of the regions among the 12, made an agreement peace uh, to relatively, you know, start fighting and finish or talk negotiation about the political dispute that brought them to the, you know, at such a conflict. So what happened is like everybody, you know, the U.S. and international community is kind of celebrating in a way this monumental and important achievement of stopping the violence in Tigray. Tigray region been under consistent violence for two plus years. On top of that, the government have stopped any kind of humanitarian aid. So they were on the verge of millions of people starving. There was no medicine going on there. And there was just millions of people were displaced. And it was just a precarious situation. But once that peace was signed in South Africa and relatively peace slowly came to Tigray, the fighting stopped, the violence picked up more in Oromia. I'm talking about drone 
usage, hundreds of people were, hundred, over 500 people have been killed since the uh, peace agreement. The first months of peace agreement, at, at least 100 people have been, uh, 500 people have been killed in Oromia. Uh, the government um, seemed to act like, uh, right now relatively, they have made uh, some kind of agreement and confidence in the Northern. They can focus and clean up OLA. OLA is a Oromo Liberation Army that are fighting the government. OLA is a splinter group from OLF. OLF is an opposition group that came to the country in 2018 as part of the peace agreement that the government overcome opposition, including the armed group. But the, when the agreement did not really last too long, so the splinter group formed an you know, armed group and then they obviously picked up the, uh, the fighting. Government have closed the non-violent peaceful struggle. So people, millions of young people joined the OLA. Right now the government have engaged for the last uh, four years with the uh, Oromo Liberation Army. I mean, I cannot tell you the amount of life that have been lost over the last four years. As we speak, there is uh, just last week, the Amhara Regional Government there is a section of Amara regional government where it's called Oromia Special Zone, which means even though the region is governed by the Amara regional government, the populations are exclusively Oromos. There's not really anybody else in there. And the Amara regional government seem to declare a war on these people right now. And so there's a violence, as we speak, hundreds of homes have been burned. Um, dozens of people have been killed according to the number we got. Uh, thousands of people have been fleeing and the internet has been shut down. In addition to that, there's still also ongoing, uh, the federal government along with the Oromia regional government are in the operation, what they call Oromo Liberation Army Cleanup. So basically, if you are suspected supporting or member or family, even potentially family member of the Oromo Liberation Army, you, uh, the government is acting, um, they will take target, they, you are a fair target to them. So this is, uh, international community is not saying anything about it. Media don't have access to any of these places. Nobody's talking about, so there's a huge humanitarian and human rights crisis happening, David. I mean, so much, I mean, I'm not even mentioning about the humanitarian need. I'm talking about just the human rights angle. Compounded, I think, by the drought conditions, not uh, not not just the government conditions. Uh, Senna, we we've set up a, a web page for people, right, at at worldbeyondwar.org/oromia, o r o m i a, uh, with a petition and with a way to email U.S. Congress members. Uh, what is the what is the substance of this, and what is the hope for it? Yeah, I think, uh, David, um, we have, I'm an American citizen. We have a 400 plus, 435 member of Congress plus 50 senators. Um, I mean, U.S. government invest millions, not millions, billions in Ethiopia for the last hundred years. I think as a taxpayers and as a Congress, they have a role to play. Where is this million, billions of dollars going? U.S. invest in Ethiopia and Africa for two reasons, obviously. Number one, being, you know, de spreading democracy and stability. That way business and people can, you know, uh, move around freely. But at the end of this year, at the end of this century, or 100 years later, U.S. got neither democracy or stability in Ethiopia. I mean, you, we, tax mayors of billions of dollars from tax, American taxpayers have won to uh, Ethiopia that did not return the American interest, which is spreading democracy and uh, respecting you know, human rights, uh, what the American people are investing for. So it's time that U.S. Congress know that if the interest of America is to spread democracy, is to really, uh, uh, com you know, really also confront China's uh, expansion in the region, that it is in the best interest for the American people, anybody that wants to do a business in there, and particularly for the U.S. Congress, to know about it and to find a lasting peace. To do that, so we put this petition together. 
asking for the U.S. Congress to look into what's going on in the largest region of the country, why there is a violence. Hundreds of people have been killed. Thousands of people have been fleeing. The you know, 2022 uh, data or 2021 data from um, internally displaced people puts Ethiopia the highest. They have 5.2 million people internally displaced. The d- December 2022, just about a month ago, USAID data came out. It shows that 5 million people needing a desperate urgent need just in Romania alone. We're not talking about the major area where there's conflict. I'm talking about in the southern part where there's a drought. Six rainy season, there's no weather. So this catastrophe is in the happening that the U.S. have responsibility, moral responsibility as a world leader. And also, I mean, Ethiopia is an, you know, a partner for the U.S. and plays a regional, uh, for security and stability, they play a regional key, uh, key part in region, regional stability, that we are asking Congress to look into what's happening in Ethiopia, in Oromia, that if we are seeking stability, in peace for the horn or in Ethiopia, and that we must also address the issue that's happening in Romania and larger southern part of Ethiopia. So that's what this petition and this uh, letter is about. I think as anybody that cares about human rights, anybody that cares about what's happening and how is dictators are misusing the taxpayers' money, and it should definitely take a look at it and speak up against this. I, I'm not 100% sure the interests of the U.S. Congress are not in selling weapons and extracting resources and dominating global markets, but I do think they could take a step in suggesting that their interests are in spreading democracy by by doing the right thing here, right? But, but David, I mean, a lot of things, yes, maybe you want to do trade, but to do the trade, you know, uh, that you still need a stability, you need a peace to continue doing any kind of business in there. So it is, that is security interest that includes the uh, trade angle. So that's, you know, I was just in uh, in London, you know, I just came back, I met with uh, several members of parliament from there who are focused on Africa. And yes, I, you know, Europe is particularly interested. Ethiopia have 123 million people. So so you have to understand it's a huge interest in Ethiopia plays a significant role in the whole continent. So yes, you have such a giant uh, a country that have a global influence. So the U.S. have interest, that even if democracy is spreading not the parity, trade and other markets is still makes Ethiopia interest. And Oromia plays a key role for that purpose, uh, David. And and the petition that people can sign at worldbeyondwar.org slash Oromia is not just to the U.S. government, but also to the European Union and other bodies, right? Absolutely. Thanks for saying that, David. I mean, it is dumb. It is to, for UN because as we speak, UN is investigation what's happening in, in the country. And there's, you know, not just even Europe. I mean, Canadian government, Australian government. And Scandinavian government that gives millions of dollars to Ethiopian government for different purposes, mainly for development, for women, for environment, for all of that. So, yes, this petition definitely will be educating people. I think it is so important, David. I think the more people we have, the more people talk about, ask about it, the more the Congress International Committee will be forced to kind of act in this in the best interest of the global stability. And what do you hope for or foresee as possible in terms of investigations, truth and reconciliation, criminal prosecutions uh, uh, around the, the abuses that have occurred in recent years? You know, uh, David, the abuses in Ethiopia, Ethiopia is one of the most misunderstood uh, country. You know, I mean, it's, you know, so many has talked about like as uncolonized country, but if you look at the act that Ethiopia have committed in the last two years, it shows savagery uh, is unspeakable. Human being burn alive, you know, um, I don't know, behaving people. If what some of the military from the Mara region and as well as Oromia region, what they're doing, if you see that, you think what ISIS did is nothing compared to what these people are doing to their own people, to end government dressed in a uniform, military uniform that's supposed to protect civilians are behaving uh, people. So these are some very aggressive graphic reports. You know, we write that on a weekly basis we take, and it's extremely disturbing uh, things that I really don't want to say here. 
what, what I want to accomplish by this uh, petition is, honestly, is that every voice matters. The more voice that we can get to say something about this, especially now because the peace agreement in the Northern have been signed and it is holding, Ethiopia is ready to move forward and to kind of chart a new day. And to do that, the international community need to pressure the Ethiopian government and everyone else involved in the conflict to sit down for negotiation, and solve the political differences through negotiation. Because at the end of the day, the people who is paying the price is not people who are fighting through arm, nor the government. It is innocent civilian, especially women and mothers are the primary target. Me as, as a woman myself, I can't tell you how much it hurt me. They have nothing to do with this conflict but they are the number one victim. They get raped, they are forced to feed. They, because of their children, they cannot live like men and just run away. So they are so back down and the, we are not looking at the impact this war has had on this woman in this community devastating that because of the absence of media in Oromia, that nobody even cannot comprehend. So yes, UN is investigating Oromia and they are, they are as part of the whole country, the, the mandate is a whole country, but the, the human rights abuse go much deeper than the last four years. But the last four years, it is so uh, it, it is so much it happened in a cluster of such a short time. And I think even getting that started can be a way to move forward. So what we hope to accomplish and to get from this petition and from the UN is justice must come for all, not just for the Oromos or the Amharas or Tigrians. They are a minority group that don't even have the voice that we have. So they also deserve a justice and the UN have a role to play in there. Then, uh, Jim Jimo, we have about one minute left. How can people follow up and keep up with your work and support what you're doing? You know what? I think, uh, thank you so much for asking that. Uh, when, if these issues appeal to you, and uh, we definitely, as Ola, uh, short name for our organization is um, OLLAA.org is our website. Uh, we depend on volunteers. Uh, we have over the last, last year, we have nearly a hundred volunteers and a lot of them are Americans and a lot of them are non oromos So if you care about human rights and uh, want to learn about what's going on in the Horn on Ethiopia, please volunteer for us. And if you are generous, like, you know, your organization that partner with us and want to have an impact and you're interested in bringing lasting peace, join and work with us. We are the leading advocacy organization that represents over 50 Oromo communities worldwide. A uh, majority of our members are here in the U.S. So there are about 27 Oromo communities. What it means is about 25 or 23 states. Each state have one Oromo community. We partner with them work and we work with their Congress. We don't do their senator. We work with sometimes with the mayor and governors to kind of raise uh, uh, about this. Oromos are one of the most marginalized voices that nobody has heard about it. So if you're interested about indigenous people, how their culture is suppressed. And, you know, as I mentioned quickly earlier, David, is that it was crime to speak of Anna Romo, to promote about Romo just about 30 plus years ago. We are the first generation that we are proud to be an Romo. So that's why we like, you know, we're happy to claim ourselves Romo, but I think we are all humans. So I think if you want, if they want to make a difference, please follow us and, you know, come to your website and follow us and ask us a question. We'll be very happy to meet with anybody. Sena Jimjimo is executive director of the Oromo Legacy Leadership and Advocacy Association. You can sign the petition and share this video everywhere at worldbeyondwar.org slash Oromia. Sena, thank you for coming on Talk World Radio. Thank you so much for having me. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.